Hey, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is How the World is Changing. And today we're going to talk about political warfare of the Philippines, otherwise known as China's silent war against the Philippines, uh, in terms of subnational incursions, with Carla S. Cruz, who joins us from Manila, the Philippines. Welcome to the show, Carla. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me again. Always. Well, from your point of view uh, of security analyst, uh, what's the news? What's the news about Sierra Madre, for example? Oh, wow. First, okay. So what's been happening here lately is we've... Sierra Madre is good. I think that Sierra Madre has been left on its own for for um, a while, but and we've been able to actually resupply through air because they haven't figured that out yet. But um, we were a, we tried to resupply on the 10th, and they had like combined everything that they've done in the last four months. So they lasered, water cannoned, blockaded, and swarmed. I think they're trying to, like, that's their buildup, very strategic on their end. But yeah. Well, a couple of things, you know. Uh, number one is, uh, you know, the show that you and I did a, a couple of shows ago was. Um, it was the subject of an article in the New York Times earlier this week, mm -hmm. uh, and it was really a track on what we talked about. Right? They must be watching Think Tech, uh, and I suppose I know, we should be watching that. that. Thank you. Thank you for your support, New York Times. <laughs> There's more coming. <laughs> we had the scoop on it. They were second. So the, the other thing is, um, you know, you gave a paper. Can you talk about the paper you gave? Sure, sure. So um, I recently, um, we did a brown bag session, which is called a brown bag session, sorry, let me just put it up. Um, a brown bag session at the Ateneo de Molina University, um, which is actually a partner of HPU, I believe. And um, the Ateneo School of Government, which is a continuing education institute within the entity, um, is has a policy center where I do investigation. The piece was on modern political warfare and how the Philippines is um, actually at the center of many of this, of many of these instances. It was presented to um, a group of diplomats, a uh, the military um, members of there were some members of the Senate. I believe there are two senators and uh, members of the research staff of both houses. Um, it was co-funded with the uh, German uh, Political Foundation, which has what, the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, if I um, pronounce it correctly. They've been a partner with, of Ateneo um, and a supporter of my research for, the, for a good part of two years. And I, I really look forward to, con to working with them again on like expanding this, because what we found was, okay, Although political warfare has always been a means to, um, you know, to coerce and interfere with the normal relations of a of a democratic institution and third party democratic institutions, China has gone that one level up and taken like, let's just say, okay, an example is the UN sister cities. You know the UN sister cities um, mm -hmm. arrangement. Mm -hmm. Okay, to you, what's the UN sister cities arrangement? Well, oh, it's, your it's di diplomatic connections between okay. cities. And so you have yeah. uh, visitors from one city going to the other and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like uh, citizen diplomacy, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. So they use this as a way to open up to a province, especially when the province has a lot of um, natural resources, like sand and mining sites you know, for different minerals. But because the laws here are not favorable to foreigners coming in, they go in, um, they sign some kind of, you know, economic participate, like economic partnership, but it's all one way. So they come and they like literally send all their workers, all their, I mean, everything's one way to teach Chinese to, um, and then they end up marrying. And then um, they end up becoming Filipino. So and they, now they, they marry local Filipinos. Now they yes. this is like the royal marriages in Europe in, in the 16th century. <laughs> Something like that, but they're not really royal. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's like degrading our race. Can I just tell you, they are degrading our race. We're a race of beautiful people who are polite and nice and lovely and love our country. And these people are rude and they spit everywhere. I'm just saying, I, I, I can say that because I see it, right? And they're people who don't actually look after the betterment of the country as a whole. So you've seen in these, and we saw in, saw in our research that these, these provinces who have wholeheartedly made these twinning commitments come off worst off, right? And so they promised like $7.1 trillion over the Duterte administration. What did they come up with? Five million dollars with four percent interest for a scrawny bridge in Metro Manila, and they wonder why we backed out of the that's bridge. A, that's a fake out. What it is? Yeah. Exactly. 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 Yeah. So okay. So all they're so, interested is really is sand. So how do they get to the sand the the fastest? Yeah. Yeah. I asked you before the show about the the history of the Belt Road. Belt Road Initiative in the Philippines, and I think it's worth mentioning what happened there. Um, they started out with it, but then the Philippines pulled the plug. Tell me more. Yeah, so we pulled the plug last week on the Belt and Road. I think the reason why, not just the high cost of the loans, but more so the fact that, well, we're an archipelago, so they would have been, it would have been very hard to connect digitally. Um, especially because the U.S. and Team Telecom with Meta and Google with the Pacific Light Cable Network cut out. It was supposed to connect from the from Hong Kong into the Philippines and terminate in Hong Kong. But this 13,500 kilometer um, uh, subsea cable from LA to Aurora here um, will not be having anything to do with China. So that contains the Philippines and China and the U.S. Um, in a very strategic way. So I don't see any value. And I think that the Philippine government also didn't see any value to be in the Belt and Road. That's good. Uh, I told you my reaction was that's a really good move back out of that deal because you can't win, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, <clears throat> yeah, moving on to the, uh, you know, the, the larger issue we plan to talk about, the uh, subnational incursions, the political incursions. Uh, so you must have an idea from your research and the paper uh, by the way, the paper was really a detailed paper. People think, you know, you go to a, 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 a university and present a paper, and it's, uh, eh, it's just a few notes. No, 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 no. This was not a few notes. This was a major research project and a major presentation. Uh, anyway, so it seems to me like we ought to examine exactly what is a subnational incursion and what does it reveal about China's long plan on you? You know, um, the Philippines is not the first country that China has tried to silently invade. Let's just put it that way. And China has made their their ways kind of they're very very long term, like a hundred year marathon, like we say, right? And um, it has always yes, it has always been their plan, but not to make the Philippines a focal point, but make the Philippines a transshipment point and a passage for Taiwan. They couldn't care less about Visayas, which is in the center of the Philippines, a group of islands, or Mindanao for that matter. So this subnational engagement is concentrated on Luzon and close to the national, the, the capital, which is Manila. So an already, let's put it this way, an already dense and overpopulated place with scant resources um, is 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 um all the more exacerbated because they're here. Okay, let's put it that way. Number one. So they tried to do this during Arroyo's administration at first by the doing the uh, ZTE um and the national broadband network that with ZTE that was canceled. And then they tried to set up um you know building all these infrastructure projects that never came to but what they've successfully been able to do, Jay, and the scary part is position people here in our BPO sector, which used to be dominated by the U.S. and um, is now, well, maybe it's split 50-50. I'm not sure about the numbers, but it's a $40 billion industry, right? Um, it's a $40 billion industry that the Philippines could lose if China 
went overboard and um, continued the 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 spite of like the crime and and the the um, lawlessness that comes with having them here, right? To me, that is warfare because you're leaving a society worse off than they were when you found them and when you wet them, and they're like so they're like bad house guests, and you just want them. To- <laughs> That's yeah. a great way to put it. So uh, you know, is but is the Philippines um, vulnerable? What I mean is, you know, you had a, you had a transition from one style of government with Duterte, and now Marcos different. It's different, and mm. um, that that difference, you know, you can speak. I know you can speak to that difference. But at the end of the day, is the Philippines, you know, vulnerable. Um, and does China see the Philippines as vulnerable? Does China see, uh, you know, opportunities here where they can take advantage of you? It's, it's sort of like uh, those guys marrying Filipino women. Right. Yes. And, all, and, and all of a sudden getting into positions of power and leverage. Yes. Um, so it, that kind of reveals what they want to do. But tell me how it works. You know, I think that personal relationships always, you know, you can take both ways. Right. But it's the people that deal with each other. It depends on your how rooted you are in your culture, how rooted you are in yourself. And where you see yourself in the bigger picture, whether you're a janitor, whether you're some, a, a journalist, whatever part of society you belong to, if you believe that we are a democracy, that we all deserve to live a free and fair life, I think you would ask questions if, for example, you have, um, you have, you know, a, uh, I can't, I don't know if I can say this on air, but like a Chinese um, owned a uh, brothel and um, torture like chamber in your neighborhood, and we're finding that this is in every like just, like in every neighborhood almost. In, in really, that's like organized crime. Rated, yes, exactly. So, cyber crime has been expanded into organized crime, international organized crime that doesn't just include drugs; it includes gambling it includes human trafficking and that's that every day we're 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 finding that you know this these people were brought in because of the economic interaction between both countries because Duterte only wanted to talk about economic interaction but this economic interaction was an opening to degrade our national security and that's what we're seeing now, right? And then now it's becoming a human security problem because these people aren't being accepted back by China. So, gee, imagine arresting all these people and then they're like, oh, well, we don't want them back, sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't want them back either, but that's come so on. They're giving people. you the problem. <laughs> yeah, so we have to house them, feed them. I said, just no. put them on a boat. Oh, this is not good. It's not healthy. Is there? I asked you before about American tourism to, um, you know, to uh, Philippines. But what about, you know, standard tourism, right? You know, come spend a week in a hotel, go on a tour, whatever that kind of thing. Um, what about Chinese coming to the to the Philippines? Do, are they coming as tourists? So I I heard about the government. I mean, I'm obviously in the defense sector, but I heard about the government trying to capitalize on this revenge tourism. And they expect about 2 million Chinese to come in before the end of the year. I have yet to see one tourist come in, but <laughs> 2 million Chinese visas are being uh, um, are being released, apparently, so 6,000 per day since September. Whether they're truthful in their declaration that they want to come in as tourists remains to be seen. But I think if they do not come in as tourists and they come in as something else, I will let you know. And I hope the New York Times picks it up. Yeah, I'd be very interested in seeing it because it could be another fake promise, you know, another fake promise, like on the commercial and side. And like when the Japanese were here during World War II, the day the war broke out, the gardener of my grandmother was a intelligence officer. Uh, well, that's actually my next question. In the United States, we have some strange intrusions by China. Uh, and and you know it's been in the press and uh, people talk about it in the institutions. One is they come to our universities and they steal intellectual property. 
Um, I'm not sure you could call it espionage, but maybe it is espionage. Oh, it is definitely. They're coming in and taking, a, especially defense type uh, intellectual property. And the other thing is they have these really strange, and I wonder if this exists in the Philippines, these really strange things they call police stations. So in Brooklyn, right? In Brooklyn and New York City, um, the police found, the NYPD found there was a Chinese police station. And it was organized by the PRC, um, and it was supposed to watch um, Chinese people in Brooklyn and make sure they towed the line and maybe, you know, maybe created a little espionage, too. And so um, th the fact that they had a police station in Brooklyn is really chilling because there might have been, in fact, I think there are other police stations that need to be rooted out. This one was rooted out. And you know, and and finally, what you get is uh, like the Confucius Society. I don't know if you have that in the Philippines, uh, where they're trying to sell, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, cultural points and affinity, and on the other hand, they're they're trying to get information uh, from college campuses and the like. Uh, and we have seen a lot of espionage in this country, and uh, there have been a, a number. It doesn't hit the press all the time, but I can tell you there have been a number of very serious defense weapon type espionage cases that have been tried in our federal courts. Um, so the question I put to you is, um, you know, what about that sort of thing in the Philippines? Are they doing espionage? Are they trying to control uh, the Chinese people that live in the Philippines? Are they trying to take intellectual property? Uh, are they trying to control things politically? Talk to me. Tell me about it. Um. Yes, they are, all of the above. And I don't think I need to go into detail because you've already detailed it. They have a menu. They just roll it out everywhere, right? But from what I see that the Philippines is trying to um, to do that's different, um, given the, I think, the great partnership that the U.S. and Philippines have had over the years that's been strengthened with President Biden and um, even your vice, the Vice President Kamala Harris, Today, you know, declared that, you know, yes, the U.S. is behind the Philippines all the way. And you've had Senators Wicker, Rich, and Rubio send a letter to President Biden saying, you know, we want a complete accountability of um, your program for the Philippines and what you're doing about the BRP Sierra Madre and the humanitarian situation that we're looking down on. I mean, that, I mean, that in itself, to me, will send a clear message to China that, it's not like before. It's not like what you did to Australia, and it's not like what you did to Italy and Germany, and and um, you know what you tried to do with the in the U.S. So it's it's very interesting, Jay, because this weekend um, there's a very strategic meeting going on um, where our defense, our president, President Marcos, is coming um, to Hawaii uh, with our defense secretary coming from Jakarta. They just had a big defense ministers meeting. He was there with Lloyd Austin. And made some great pronouncements, but um, our our new chief of staff of the armed forces is coming to visit, and he's actually there right now. Um, and that, to me, delivers two things: one, strategic messaging to not just China, but our the, them and their their allies, funny people. And then, second, the operational significance that this partnership that you know we do stand shoulder to shoulder with America, and. The Philippines provides a terrain for America to train and better their entire system that you don't have in the U.S., right? So it's a perfect, I think it's a perfect marriage. But um, the choice of chief of staff is very significant, I think, to the U.S. partnership. Why do I say this, Jay? His grandfather was a Buffalo soldier who stayed in the Philippines because he obviously fell in love, but that's another story. And uh, so he's mulatto, and he he understands. He went to school there, so he understands what it means to kind of fight with America. But he's so strong in his being Filipino because he's actually native Filipino, like from Baguio. Um, so he's so strongly Filipino and so rooted in his Philippine, like in his in his Filipino values, but appreciates what we can take from America. And that's something that China needs to understand, that they don't have to steal, they don't have to kidnap, they don't have to torch people or electrocute people to get what they want. They can be nice and friendly and diplomatic, and we can all live happily ever after. But apparently they don't see it that way. 
Right. What's interesting is in, in, in the Times, the report lately was that uh, this is the first time people can remember where Xi Jinping came here, talked to Joe Biden, and um, he needed things. He needed things. That's, and that motivated his the dialogue with Joe Biden. I'm not sure that Joe Biden can or would give him anything, but, but it's a different kind of dynamic now. And the question, you know, and as you and I talked before, not, not much came out of that meeting. Except, uh, you know, well, maybe, yeah, right. Maybe there'll be more talks later. But uh, query, did uh, President Marcos meet with Joe Biden also? What was the nature of that, if it happened? Um, I believe they met. Yeah, I, yeah. Believe, I know he met with um, Vice President Harris. Uh, but um, they're in touch all the time. Mm. So it, mm. I don't think it's about the cameras. If yes. I can be very frank with you. Yes. And, Apex a meeting, like if that's something that like you go see your friends once a year, like we walk into their house and have coffee every other day, so, <laughs> literally, right? <laughs> and and like so, for example, like we have we have troops here, you know, all around the year. Um, this this new armed forces is significant because the head PACOM is Indo PACOM is our is our um is our counterpart, right? Aquilino, the head of PACOM, and our, uh, I should say, but he's the West Palm commander now. Hopefully one day he'll be our, um, our flag officer in command of the Navy. What's his classmate? They were all in the U.S. together. So that high level goes really deep, right? That reassurance that we're, the Philippines is doing its part, the U.S. is doing its part, goes back to like, pulling each other's shorts down at Naval War, at, at the Army War College, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think we're pretty good in that sense. We also just ended some really, like, significant exercises. So I don't think APEC's a big thing for us. And I don't think that, like, Biden and, and, and Marcos being photo, photographed together is a big thing because we always will say the same thing. I mean, we're more solid than ever. And I think at the end of the day, the Philippine military is seen as an equal partner, mm. which was never seen before. Mm. Um, of course, we're former colony, right? I'm half, so I'm like half colony, half colonizer. So I colonize and half colonizer. So <laughs> kind of confused, but it's all right. Um, so, well, we were but, with you from nineteen, from eighteen ninety eight, as I recall, for many years. Yeah, so, we're, so, we're but I'm half. Found so, the hip, exactly. yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah. well, this all leads me to ask you about the media, okay? So what we have here is a is a is a phenomenon um, where the Chinese are looking to um, extend their influence in the South China Sea, or their control of it, however you want to put that, uh, and and maybe line up against Taiwan, um, and and um, you know use the Philippines. Uh, or threaten the Philippines, or undermine the Philippines in aid of that long plan. Um, and the question I, I, I put to you is, is this being covered in the Filipino press? Is this being covered in, you know, the newspapers of a democratic you know, republic like the Philippines? Um, are, are people writing about it? Are they revealing it or not? Um, I think, yeah, it is significantly better now than when the last president was in power. So, but this whole declaration that transparency is an innovative approach to media relations that uh, certain American gentleman claims that is his, you know, is his stand, um, it's not, right? We're just doing things right by the people now because we live in less of an authoritarian regime. And so more than just being covered in the main, the mainstream media, Yes, the, 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 actually the, the Coast Guard already has a permanent detail of press who are brave enough to go out every single time because the people need to know. And it was interesting because the last time, Jay, on the 10th, I think, yeah, on the 10th, the Chinese came out with um, the news like right as it was happening. No, the October one. Remember I told you about it? Mm -hmm. Right as it was happening with the wrong times. So they thought they could get ahead of us. And then they obviously did it, right? So they didn't do that this last time. But what I'm saying is we are transparent. We let our 
people know, and that's why we're angry that this oil tanker issue hasn't been fixed yet, but that'll be fixed soon. Um, and, and people are starting to talk. And it's keeping this government accountable. It keeps the military accountable. And we want to continue talking to our Hawaiian neighbors, our neighbors in the Pacific Islands, to show that this is a problem and that we're here together, right? Because we're experiencing the same thing. And it's always, um, it's always an information issue, right? It doesn't get to us. It doesn't get dispersed. And I think that's a clear message that we have. Like, that's something that you and I should take up um, and keep that conversation going with the other Pacific Islands as well. Oh, I totally agree. And let's plan to do that. But I wonder on the other side of it, you know, the Chinese are not unsophisticated when it comes to propaganda. Matter of fact, you know, that's what they do. And I wonder if they are using the media in the Philippines for propaganda to advance misinformation about China and about China's intentions in the Philippines and the South China Sea. Are you seeing that in the in the media in the Philippines? What we're seeing more, Jay, is actually them um, just trying to discredit the institutions. I think it would be too deep for them to go to say that, oh, they're trying to discredit, like, I mean, they're trying to advance their narrative and all of that. No, they're not trying to do that. They're just trying to curtail the democratic institutions, you know, foundations and power and obviously in the, the hopes of letting the Filipinos lose trust in the government. But, yeah, that's clear. Well, this is pretty serious. I mean, we talk about, uh, you know, political warfare, the silent war, the Chinese against Philippines, trying to take advantage, trying to, you know, move into every possible, you know, ex exploitation. Um, what can the Filipino specific. government do about that? And is it doing it? Uh, should it do it? You know, what should the plan be? To keep them away from, you know, your central institutions. I think we need to hit them where it hurts. We need to hit them where it hurts economically. We need to cut them at the knees and not allow them to trade I mean, to to use, like for example, their own financial networks. They should use our own networks, right? We need to deport people and we need to either jail people or drown them in the sea. Like whatever it is, they shouldn't be part of our society, and we should. So we have the senator that's actually called for the twilight of these Philippine overseas gaming operations, which is which proliferates crime, which proliferates trafficking and drugs here in our society. And um, you know, I I would like that people just become more vigilant and create the culture of caution that you know you know something isn't right, say something about it because that's not how our society is. We're not repressive, we're not silent, and we're definitely not okay. What we have is a, you know, a silent war, political warfare of sorts. We have all the, this bag of tricks that we see rolled out on the Philippines. Um, and uh, we, we hope that we'll be able to stop that, as we hope we'll be able to stop it in the U.S. It's not so easy to stop it in a democracy. And you so... What we need to do, Jay? Yeah. Tell you. We need to define what war means today. We need to define what an act of aggression means today. It doesn't mean that you're being shot with a gun and somebody died. What it means is for a society to be left off worse than how they found you and how they came in. If there is no value for these people to be where you are, they're, they're doing something that is not, that is uh, to your detriment, right? And that should be enough reason for these people to not be there. If you have to know their intentions. They have to be transparent. They have to, if not, that if they're not transparent, it's espionage. It's black or white, right? Like, why are they doing this? Is it going to benefit people or not? Is it going for the greater good or not? I think it's that basic. And as it escalates and becomes, you know, more and more intense, then you define what it means to be an aggressor. What you what you define what you define as warfare. But at the end of the day, if people are worse off than they were when you started there is something really, really wrong. And you can see that the degradation of the human and the security of the human being here in the Philippines, whether by through drugs or, or like their social, you know, their, cog their cognition or their, their physical security um, is, is really, is really being, um, is something that I think is a form of warfare that needs to be defined 
by whoever it is that defines this and do something about it. But definitely the Philippines can't do something about it at all. Carla, are there others who feel this way? Other members of your generation who uh, yeah. hopefully would take the reins at some point and um, and and work on this issue. Are, th are there a lot of people like you? We hope yes. I find them every day. Find them every day. Yeah. Thank mm, you. Okay. Follow me on Twitter, Jay. I think we need a, tw a Twitter. You need a Twitter. <laughs> That's a thing. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Carla Cruz, our correspondent in Manila, um, in the Philippines, is wedded to the, you know, the uh, the American Republic at the hip, bonded to us at the hip uh, since 1898, and we have great affinity, great historical connection, and and indeed, aside from all that, you're very important to us geopolitically, so we want you to succeed. We want your democracy to be strong. And we want your generation to make it strong. And we're so happy to talk to you, Carla. Thank you, Jay. Mahalo. <laughs> Mahalo. Aloha.